This is SAT 105, Unit 6, Food Deserts. When you look across the city, you can see many different ideas of where we get food. We can look at um, the image on the left. There's all types of displays for different types of food. Or you look on the right, you can see a burned out area, broken glass, where food is also delivered. What we've seen is where we live makes a huge difference. If we live in the affluent suburbs, we have a good supply of food. If we live in the poor ghettos, we have a poor supply of food. This map here gives an idea of where the people live in slums. You show you across Africa, there's still a fair amount of areas where 90 to 100% of the people live in a slum. The people who live in this area have certainly worse outcomes. The infant mortality is up, disability in the elderly, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, asthma, all worse in these depressed areas. It's also associated with obesity even though we call this a food desert. Here's a, a map showing the 30th biggest mega slums in the world. Now some of these have not just one mega slum, but some of them have several mega slums in the areas, showing that many more people live in this area and many of these people are starving. What is a food desert? Uh, this is an area with few or very little access to large grocery stores. Large grocery stores offer fresh and affordable foods needed to maintain a good diet. What we found in these food deserts, there's a large amount of uh, fast food restaurants. There's a large amount of pharmacies that also sell food. There's a large amount of gas stations which also sell food. These are entirely of our own creation. People in this area use food stamps. 92% of all food stamp purveyors are in this fringe. That's what we're talking about. The gas stations, the liquor stores, the convenience stores, the pharmacies that all sell food products. They're small enough they don't have the fresh fruits and vegetables. They're small enough uh, that they don't worry about having sustainable type foods. Only 8% of them are the big chain grocers. Uh, long ago, looking into the history of medicine, it was determined that frequently what you ate gives you a good idea of what your health care could be. We all have the pictures of the old English lord who was sitting there, not able to walk because his foot was so swollen from gout. We knew this was because of overeating of certain types of food. Uh, this was first written about in the late 1700s. Uh, 1755 to 1826, uh, Jean-Athelme Dindat Savarin wrote about this. He talked about what you eat and where you live. He talks about what type of health that you have. Marie Gallagher here in Chicago was commissioned to do a study about the impact of food deserts on public health. Uh, she wrote several long articles about this. And one of your videos is her talking about food deserts. So be sure to listen to that. She found that we did have problems with the food deserts. Diseases were much higher, especially diabetes. You know, diabetes is something that we see that we have problems with uh, controlling our blood sugar. Because of this, we have problems with our blood flow. The blood flow to our extremities is worse. We get ulcers. We don't heal from our wounds as fast. Our stomachs can be also diseased. 
because the diabetes affects our small vessels and consequently don't absorb our food as well. We have more nausea and vomiting. If we let the sugars get out of control, we can actually go into comas. Our eyes over time, because it affects the small blood vessels, we have blurred vision and eventually we can lose our sight. The Diabetes Prevention Program discovered that types of diabetes can be prevented or delayed by changing our lifestyle, which includes changing our diet. We have to have a healthy diet, a balanced diet that includes fruits and vegetables. The poor diets include processed foods, high fat meals, and empty calorie foods. All these products found in food deserts, are found in convenience stores, are found in pharmacies, are found in gas stations. It's no wonder that in our food deserts we're seeing a higher incidence of diseases. Marie Gallagher again, uh, when she talked about the deserts in Chicago, they seem to be almost entirely in African American neighborhoods. We were able to develop a blood mapping system. If you go to the Food Access Research Atlas, the site which you see printed on top here, it's also in your, in your syllabus, you'll see that you can go to any part of the United States and see where we have food deserts. You can see, go to any part of the United States and see how far it is to a major chain grocery store. You can see how far, if you have to take a bus, do you walk there? Or do you need a car to get to these areas? So this Food Access Research Atlas provides a large amount of food access data. I can create a map wherever you live and create a map of any part of the United States that you are in. Other areas on this atlas uh, will show us the, the distance markers, how far it is to the grocery stores. Um, is it more than half a mile to a supermarket or is it a mile to a supermarket? We can see whether this area has a high percent of households that don't have a car, that have one car. We can see how far it is to a grocery store based upon your income average. We do see that tracks are developed in this area, again, depending upon what your income level is, comparing it with the state income level. We can see that if we apply a half a mile demarcation in a 10 mile distance in the rural areas, 52.5 million people, 17% of the U.S. population, have low access to a supermarket. If we double that in size, we can decrease uh, the amount of people that have access to a supermarket. So it seems in that half a mile, we are able to reduce food deserts if we can only create grocery stores in that extra half mile of distance. Premature death due to cancer and cardiovascular disease is also greater in food deserts. Let's check with a cheeseburger. What did it look like 15 years ago? What it looks like now? 333 calories versus almost 600 calories. We have to remember too that in these food deserts, there are some people that are better off. Again, Marie Gallagher looked at four areas, the local availability of supermarkets, the racial ethnic disparities in food access, socioeconomic disparities, and the difference in chain versus non-chain stores. The people in these low income areas in the food deserts find that it's much easier instead of going to the grocery store. Remember, we're only talking about an extra half a mile here. 
instead to go to the local convenience store and find some food that have are energy dense. Frequently in this area too, even if food carts were surprised that had fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, that had nutritious meals, people didn't want to go to them. They were very distrustful in this area. The whole idea of taste, texture, and appearance, the history of what you ate, made a difference in this area. We can change it. How do people uh, work in the convenience stores and the gas stations also made a difference. If they were friendly people, the people in the food deserts frequently come back to this area, disregarding the fact that they didn't have the most nutritious food. Another indication is where the bus stops are. You have to remember, if you're taking a bus, how much food can you carry at one time? How much of the big grocery stores are open 24 hours a day? If we're working different shifts and you're on the day shift, you may not be able to go to the grocery store. If you're on the night shift, maybe you want to sleep through this time. So we have to change some of our ideas of what grocery stores are like. If you don't have a car or a truck, Again, this affects whether or not you're going to go to the grocery store. In the typical Afro-American block, the nearest grocery store is twice as far as the neighborhood convenience store or the neighborhood fast food restaurants. If you have to take the car or the bus, we tend not to walk. We don't walk. We have less exercise and your obesity rates go up. As the obesity rates go up, this leads to other diseases such as diabetes, other chronic health problems, lower quality of life, especially for our mothers and children. As you can see, it's not one problem, and so not one solution can do something. What can we do, though? The first number one answer is go to the community garden. By building a community garden, you get the whole neighborhood involved. If the neighborhood is suddenly involved in planting vegetables, in harvesting these vegetables, weeding the area, watering it, that there seems to be more of a community togetherness developed. The second thing you can do is have a new grocery community. Some of the bigger grocery communities. There's an area in Chicago that this happened in the liver disease went down, diabetes went down, cancer went down, cardiovascular disease went down, just having the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables in the area. Chicago has numerous community gardens. Most big towns have numerous community gardens. The more that can be out there, the better the chances of decreasing our disease. We're now having fresh food carts going out there. These fresh food carts are also helping reduce the number of cardiovascular diseases in the area. In the West Englewood area in uh, Chicago, a new grocery store went in. The people in the area suddenly started buying more fruits and vegetables. What can we do to get these larger chains to come into the area? We can make it easier for them. We might reduce the tax rates to get them to come into this area. Certainly in the West Englewood area, it suddenly stopped being part of a food desert. If you went back and looked at, at that food desert map, it had changed for the West Englewood neighborhood in the Chicago area. Another thing you can do is belong to a food co-op. The more of these are being developed, and you can go online to that website, www.coopdirectly.org, and there's a directory there which shows you where they are. Now these are places that allow the community to get together and buy food at a much lower rate. The money 
and volunteer is spread across the whole community. Consequently, things are cheap. Because of this, more people are involved, we get more natural food, more organic food. That's a picture of the first co-op that was out there, at the Todd's Lane one, uh, in England. This is where they showed that belonging to a co-op can actually reduce your incidence of cardiovascular diseases. Co-ops are open to everyone. When a decision is made, again, it was very democratic, one person, one vote. All of the money is spent for the, for the, the food that is there. There's no credit. Anything that is extra is returned to the members. They frequently have educational meetings. And frequently between the different co-ops, they look to see what the best prices are. And so across the nation, co-ops co can even have lower fees for food 